Hi folks, I'm here in chapter 7 of the course packet and in this video we're going to learn about the idea of a permutation test. And to set the stage for this idea, uh, I'm going to review uh, very briefly here the four major steps that we undertake in a hypothesis test. Uh, step 1 is to specify a null hypothesis. Step 2 is to specify a test statistic uh, that is the measure of evidence in the data against the null hypothesis. Uh, where more extreme values of the test statistic indicate greater strength of evidence against that null hypothesis. Uh, third, you have to calculate the probability distribution of that test statistic under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. Uh, and then finally, you have to look at that probability distribution to give you some context for whether your observed data looks consistent or inconsistent, believable or not believable, under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. And in most real data analysis applications, this step right here, step three, calculating the probability distribution of the test statistic under the null hypothesis, is far and away the most challenging part of this whole process. In this video, uh, we're going to learn about the permutation test as a systematic way of doing this in most data analysis problems. Uh, and to set the stage uh, for the, the test with the data analysis example, I'm going to point uh, you to this figure right here. So this is a map. Uh, it uh, technically is called a chloropleth map, uh, which is a situation in which you map uh, the underlying value of some geographic region to a color. Uh, and so here the colors uh, are measuring the gun murder rate in all 50 states plus the District of Columbia. And here uh, to sort of uh, remove the, uh, the visual artifact of uh, the fact that states have different sizes, uh, we've, we've got a, a hex map or a hexagon map here of the United States where states are usually in kind of the right place. You know, Texas down here at the bottom, Florida hanging off here over the right, Maine up here in the top, uh, but every state is an equally sized hexagon. Uh, the color shade of each state here indicates how high its gun murder rate is uh, per 100,000 people. Okay, so that's the that's the colors here, and so red, like in Louisiana uh, and D.C. right here, uh, would indicate high gun murder rate. Uh, you know, Missouri, Michigan, South Carolina, also pretty high, and then the lower uh, murder rate states would be, you know, up here in New England, uh, out here in Hawaii, and then all out west right here tend to be lower than average. Okay, so that's one piece of information conveyed by this map. Uh, the other piece of information is the outline color of the map. Okay, so this takes a little bit of explanation. You notice that there are some states that are outlined in black, you know, for example, New Hampshire or Washington, uh, and there are other states that are outlined in gray, you know, for example, Georgia or Texas or Nevada out here. And that outline color uh, indicates whether that state received a passing or a failing grade. Uh, and, you know, that's uh, a um, a designation made by this research center called the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. So this is effectively a think tank or a research center uh, that has looked at a state's gun laws and made an assessment, uh, does the state pass or does the state fail, and their criteria are uh, you know, just explicitly in favor of gun control. Okay, so the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence is an advocacy organization, uh, and uh, you know, they rate a state as passing if it has more restrictive gun control laws, and failing if it has less restrictive gun control laws. Uh, and so this map, if you sort of carefully track you know, which states have passing grades, which states have failing grades, and what their gun murder rates are, suggests an association between the states that have failing grades versus the states that have passing grades on this dot plot over here towards the right-hand side of the page. You notice that for the states with failing grades, their mean tends to be here of about three gun murders per 100,000 people. Uh, actually, that's the median, uh, not the mean. Uh, whereas for the passing states, it tends to be uh, you know, about 30% lower over here, just a shade above two. And there's obviously a lot of variability in both of these groups, uh, but that difference in medians uh, at least according to the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence, is suggestive uh, that there is some systematic association between the grade of uh, that they are assigning a state's gun laws and the murder rate. Uh, and so this is now obviously a much more serious uh, and important question of public policy. Uh, and before you even begin to wade into the debate on gun laws or gun policy here, uh, it helps to sort of take a step back and say, okay, how should we interpret the evidence that we're seeing in this picture? Uh, and, you know, this is a classic hypothesis testing problem. There are really two ways that we can explain the data in the figure that we just saw. 
Uh, the first hypothesis is that we're seeing just noise. In other words, there is no systematic relationship between murder rates and gun laws, uh, and that the observed uh, relationship that we're seeing is consistent with other unrelated sources of random variation. Uh, you can imagine if you just arbitrarily divided up the states into uh, you know, group one and group two, you know, and that was, you know, arbitrarily here, the failing and the passing states, and then you measured any arbitrary numerical fact, you know, the per capita potato chip consumption, or the number of times that somebody has eaten a tuna fish sandwich in the last year. Any numerical variable associated with two arbitrary groups of states might, just by chance, be unevenly distributed among those states. And the question at issue is whether that hypothesis is plausible in light of the data, or whether instead, uh, hypothesis two over here is more plausible, that the observed relationship between murder rates and gun laws is simply too large to be consistent with a kind of random variation that we might uh, say there. Uh, and obviously in this context, uh, it's hypothesis one that's the null hypothesis. We would call hypothesis two the alternative hypothesis. Uh, and in this case, the alternative hypothesis is really just like the logical negation of the null hypothesis. Although, you know, depending on context, it can be a lot more specific. So which of these two hypotheses is more plausible in light of the data? Uh, we will address this using a permutation test. Okay, so, you know, we've already uh, established step one of the hypothesis test, a uh, uh, four-step process, namely, what is our null hypothesis? <clears throat> And we've already really gotten at, at, uh, at step two over here, if we go back to this figure, what is our implicit test statistic in our discussion right here? Well, the obvious one uh, would be to look at the difference between these two medians right there. I drew that a little bit wrong, but you know, there's the median for one group of states, there's the median for the other, and that difference right there, whatever that numerical magnitude is, is measuring the correlation between the x variable here and the y variable here, the outcome, uh, and that is an obvious candidate for a test statistic to decide whether the null hypothesis is plausible or not. Or not. Obviously, the bigger that difference, uh, the more evidence we have against the null hypothesis that this difference right here could be explained due to random chance. Okay, now we come to step three, which is calculate the test statistics probability distribution under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. Uh, now, if you go back to like the Patriots coin flipping example, it was really easy to simulate data under the null hypothesis. We could just uh, code up a Monte Carlo simulation that would repeatedly flip a virtual coin 25 times and keep track of the winner. Uh, but this is one of those uh, you know, much more common real-life hypothesis testing situations that don't involve coins. Uh, imagine that. And that makes this virtual coin flipping approach by Monte Carlo simulation pretty unhelpful as a general strategy, as compelling as a, an approach it is for the Patriots coin flipping example. However, in most situations, we still can use this power of computers, the power of Monte Carlo simulation, to understand what our test statistic might look like if the null hypothesis were true, and that's where a permutation test comes in. So let's see an example uh, of a permutation of the data that's going to be kind of the raw material for the permutation test. Uh, and so, you know, just to give a preview, the kind of thing that we're doing in this figure up here at the top of the page uh, is going to be the kind of thing that we repeat many, many thousands of times in a permutation test. So let's first try to understand what this figure actually represents. So what we've done here to construct this map, this uh, superficially looks very similar to the map from a few pages ago, uh, which I will uh, I'll remind you. Here's the actual data. So each state's outline is its actual grade from the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence and its color is its actual gun murder rate. So this, uh, the, the grade you think of as the predictor, and the murder rate is like the response. Okay, so let's contrast that with the map a couple of pages later here. <clears throat> you notice that the colors associated with each state are the same. In other words, the Y variable, murder rate per 100,000 people, is the same for each state as in the previous plot, but that the outline colors are completely different. So in this case, uh, each state has an outline color that has nothing to do with its actual grade from the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. Instead, what we've done is give a random permutation of the grades. So maybe in this particular example, uh, you know, Connecticut had a passing grade and Texas had a failing grade before. And you notice in this case, it happens to be the shuffling of the X variable here it means that Connecticut has a failing grade and Texas has a notionally passing grade. That's not the state's true grade, it's a shuffled version of the state's grade. So if you want to think algorithmically what we've done here, uh, 
is we it's it's as if we have collected all 51 states grades and written their grade on a little card collected all 51 of those cards, shuffled those cards, and then dealt them out again, as if it were a new deck of cards. Uh, and so obviously that completely scrambles the relationship between the x variable here and the y variable here, uh, because the x variables are simply assigned randomly. And, and technically the mathematical term for this is a permutation or a shuffling of the state's grades. Uh, and so this has the effect of breaking any association between the x and the y variable. The natural question is, okay, now what happens if we treated these grades, these shuffled grades, as if they were the real grades, and asked what's the difference in medians between the notionally failing states and the notionally passing states? So in this particular example right here, we notice there's actually a, a negative difference. In other words, these passing states have a higher rate than the failing states over here. Uh, but it's not a zero difference. You know, that difference right there, uh, you know, just eyeballing it, how big is that? That's maybe, I don't know, 0.2 murders per 100,000 people or something like that. So it's not a zero difference. That is obviously something that we could get by random chance. So, you know, can we get a difference as big as 0 0.2 murders per 100,000 people just by chance? Absolutely, because here's a, a perfect example where there's no systematic association between the X and the Y in this, in this uh, map, and he, yet here we have some kind of non-zero difference between the groups. Well, it helps to do this a little bit more than one time in order to get some idea of what variation in the difference in medians over here in this plot that we might expect under the null hypothesis. And that's exactly what this next series of plots is getting. Uh, instead of one shuffling of the cards or one shuffling of the failing versus passing grades for the states, we've got six sets of them right here. So, uh, you know, try, it's hard to squeeze all this onto one page, but if you kind of look in, in this uh, kind of... Um, box plot over here, you notice just by chance the failing states were up here and the passing states were down here, so that's a difference of about one. Over here, the, pa the failing states actually you know, had a, were about half a, a unit higher than the passing states. Here, the passing states were higher. The point is every single one of these maps is giving us one example of a difference in medians between the two groups, the failing states and the passing states the failing states and the passing states, and so on and so forth, for a situation in which the null hypothesis is true by design because of the shuffling of the cards. So here's six examples, and you're already beginning to get a sense that just by chance, we can see reasonably large differences between the failing and the passing states over here just by chance. So there's a difference as big as one. And if you want to get a much better sense of what this difference can look like uh, just due to random chance, don't just do this once, don't just do it six times, uh, do it, you know, a thousand or ten thousand times. And so that's exactly what you're seeing in this figure right here. So what we've done is reconstructed a set of maps like the six on this page, but not just one map, thousands and thousands of maps, each time uh, independently shuffling the grades in a different way associated with each state, shuffling the x variable, in other words. And we're keeping track each time of the difference in medians between the passing states and the failing states with the shuffled grades. And this histogram right here, it's a pretty ugly, lumpy looking histogram. You got kind of one lump over here and another lump over here, but don't focus on the shape. It doesn't have to be a normal distribution or anything like that. This thing right here, this however ugly it is, a histogram only a mother could love, is the probability distribution of our test statistic, the difference in medians, under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, that there is no systematic difference on average between the passing states and the failing states. And we know that because every single uh, entry that went into this histogram was simulated in a situation where the null hypothesis was true by design. So that's step three, and that's the permutation test. We accomplish step three by taking our original data set, shuffling the predictor variable, reassigning it randomly to individual cases within the data set, recomputing the test statistic, having shuffled that x variable, and then at the end of a thousand or ten thousand such shuffled data sets, asking what does that histogram look like? And here it is. So now we've accomplished step three, the crucial and usually most difficult step in our hypothesis test, and now it's simply, what is the context? Within the context of this probability distribution, does the actual difference that we observe for the real passing states and the real failing states look extreme or not? 
Well, it's not dead smack in the middle of the histogram, but it's not way, way out here in the tails or out here in the tails either. Uh, and so the, the argument would be that the kind of difference we've observed of something like uh, 0.8 or something like that uh, difference uh, between the passing states and the failing states in terms of the gun murder rate per 100,000 people looks reasonably consistent with a null hypothesis. So there we are. That's the four steps of a hypothesis test, all carried out. Uh, and we have failed to reject the null hypothesis in this particular context. And if you wanted to uh, compute a, uh, some kind of numerical measure, uh, we'll talk about that in the next video, but an obvious way to do that would be to focus on this tail area out here. In other words, how likely are you under the null hypothesis to get a result at least as extreme as the actual difference you observe for the real data set under the null hypothesis. That idea will be the concept of a p-value, and that is what we will talk about in the next video as we uh, slowly get a little bit more sophisticated in reasoning about step four of the hypothesis test, uh, how to decide whether the data that you've actually observed is consistent or not with the null hypothesis.